Um, was generated out of Revelation chapter 4, where the angels sing to the praise of God, holy, 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 and is, uh, I'm be, since I'll be preaching from Revelation, uh, to the whole book of Revelation, actually, I thought that might be an appropriate hymn for us. Uh, let's hear the word of God, Revelation chapter 1, I'll be reading verses 1 through 11. This will not be an expository message, as is my common practice, but it will be one that gives an overview of of the book of Revelation, and it gets its starting here, of course, in Revelation chapter 1. Let us give our attention to the reading of God's Word. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy, and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, Write in the book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is truth, which has been given to us by your grace to sanctify us as we come to know it better, thereby knowing you better. Help us, O oh Father, as we consider this difficult portion of Scripture, that we might have a better handle on it, that we might be able to understand uh, this glorious passage uh, that you have given us regarding um, the coming of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And we pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, I think everyone here would probably agree that Revelation is one of the most difficult books in the Bible, and probably you would go so far as to say it is the most difficult book in the Bible. And one of the reasons for its difficulty is because it is a sample of apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature flourished in Judaism from about 200 B.C. to 200 A.D., and therefore it's separated from us by a great distance, not only of space, uh, but of time as well. We're just not that familiar with it. And in fact, Revelation is the only book in the Bible that is wholly given over to an apocalyptic expression of its truths. Now, Ezekiel has some apocalyptic images, Daniel a little bit, but in Revelation, we have a wholesale apocalyptic statement. In fact, the book starts off, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. Now, apocalyptic literature presents, the historical, presents historical truths in a dramatic form. They present us with bizarre images, bold colors, terrifying sounds, and gruesome actions in many respects. Now one key issue for trying to get a handle on the book of Revelation, in, in my understanding, one key issue for this very difficult book is to correctly recognize its basic structure. We need to know how Revelation is structured in order to see where it's going and what it's saying. And so uh, this afternoon, uh, my message is on the flow in Revelation. We'll be looking at that structure of Revelation and its implications. Now, the immediate question that has to be asked regarding the flow of Revelation is, does it have a linear progression that is a chronological development of its storyline, or is it Recapit uh, recapitulation, giving us a spiral approach to its ending. And so let's begin by considering first Revelation's basic outline. Now, Revelation is hard to outline. 
In fact, I believe it's impossible to outline down to the details because of the very nature of the way it's structured. It has been said where you have five commentators on Revelation, you will have six outlines. No, just six, not ten. He's reading different commentators than I am. And so we need to recognize that the commentators themselves, as bright as they are, as diligently as they have studied this glorious book, come up with all sorts of different structures and outlines for the book. And this is because of the back and forth movement in the book, because of the many subsets that are undergoing under the uh, scenes of the book, because of the repetition that's involved, that makes it very difficult to outline. But I believe that there is a basic structure. It won't give us a detailed approach to the book, but it'll present us a basic structure that will be helpful to understanding what John is getting at and the message we need to get from it. It's a four-point outline. So obviously John was not a Baptist since he has a four-point outline instead of a three. But surprisingly, it's not relative to the seals or to the trumpets or to the bowls, as you might think, since they're a recurring series of events in the book. These are only subsets of the broader theme in Revelation. Now, the main hinges of the book of Revelation, I believe, are found in this recurring phrase, in the spirit. Four times in the book of Revelation, at dramatic junctures, we hear John saying, I was in the spirit. These are the main hinges of the book of Revelation. They don't appear randomly. On a first reading of Revelation, you might think, well, John every now and then says in the spirit. But it's not just John every now and then. John has a purpose for placing the in the spirit statements as he does. These are not random statements by John. They are structural statements by John. And in each case, in each of the four in the spirit statements, you will find John has moved to a new sphere and he's looking upon a new scene. It's not just a random statement. He is moving from one place to another in, in these four in the spirit statements. And furthermore, each of these four in the spirit statements has judicial implications for the forensic drama that I believe the book of Revelation is. Revelation is presenting us a, for, a forensic, a judicial drama regarding what is to happen to Israel in AD 70 is my understanding of the book. Just a real quick synopsis there. But let's look at these four in the spirit statements and see how they help in structuring the book. And the first is found in Revelation 1, verses 9 and 10. And Revelation 1, 9 introduces the section from Revelation 1, 9 all the way through the end of what you might know of as the seven letters, but would be better called the seven oracles. Revelation 1, 9 to chapter 3, verse 22. And when John is in the Spirit, he sees the seven churches. In Revelation 1, 9 and 10, we read, I was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And then he sees the seven churches. Then he writes the seven oracles to the seven churches. Here, John himself is under judicial censure from the Roman Empire, being banished to the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God, because of his ministering the word of God uh, against the Roman wishes. Rome has banished him. And then John writes these seven oracles that follow, and the seven oracles are basically investigative, investigative judgments of each of the seven churches. He searches out all of the seven churches, and five of those churches he warns and criticizes. Only two of those uh, are unscathed by John's denunciation. Now the oracles follow the pattern of the covenant lawsuit in the Old Testament. Don't have time to develop that. I'm sure you've probably heard of the covenant lawsuit pattern. But each of the oracles follows a basic structure that is the outline to a covenant lawsuit in the Old Testament. In the next verse, in the next in the spirit situation, we're going to find that there's another forensic setting. And the next one is in chapter 4, verse 1. In, when he's in heaven. And chapter 4, verse 1 to chapter 16, 21 is introduced by this statement. And here we're going to see God's judicial throne. 
Now, remember in the preceding one, John was under judicial censure from Rome. Now where he's going to look up into heaven and he's going to see God's judicial throne to see who's really behind the scenes of things. In chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, we read, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven. This is clearly a judicial situation that John is facing now. And the judgments of Revelation that are to come later on in the book will all flow from this judicial throne on which the God, the Lord of the universe, is seated. And though God's people, like John, suffer on the earth, remember John's banished to Patmos, and he's writing to a suffering people that he calls to perseverance. Though they are suffering like him, this early vision assures them that God is on the throne and his will will be accomplished. All things are under his control. So the first vision in the book of Revelation, not counting the visions relative to uh, to John's introducing the book, but when the judgments actually begin, the first vision in Revelation 4, 1 and following tells us God is in control. He is in charge. And so this is going to steal his recipients for the abuse that they will receive from Rome and from uh, Israel and any other source. And then thirdly, we have another in the spirit vision in chapter 17, verse 1 through 3 is where we find the vision statement, but that covers chapter 17, 1 through 21, 8. And here John sees a harlot who is judicially judged by God. Now, the third in the spirit vision and the fourth in the spirit vision are related directly by strong parallel. They form a negative and a positive image of something. One has an evil harlot, and the other has a glorious bride. And we can see how one's a negative image, and one's a positive image of using a woman, a harlot and a bride. So in this third in the spirit vision, what we're going to find is John presents a harlot under judgment by God Almighty. In Revelation 17, 3, we read, He carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on the scarlet beast. And reading on, we'll find that it's the harlot, the great harlot Babylon. Now, the place of this great evil character is not in heaven where God's throne is. Her sphere is not in heaven where God's throne is, but she is in the wilderness under the judgment of God. She's in a place of woe, a place of despair. She's in a place of judgment because of the forensic judicial character of the book of Revelation. John will hear the harlot's sentence, his, her judicial sentence, and witness her judgment in this portion of his revela revelation that he's given to us. And the first century Christians need to know, they need to understand that Babylon, the oppressor, is going to be judged. She's going to be off in the wilderness under the judgment of Almighty God. Thus, like the vision of God on the throne, we have this vision of the judgment of the harlot, both of those are to encourage the saints with perseverance holding to the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, fourthly, in a high mountain, the in the spirit, next in the spirit statement has John in the high mountain in Revelation 21, 9 uh, through 22, 5 is the section introduced there. And in that high mountain, he sees a new Jerusalem coming. Now, notice how similar this vision report is to Revelation 17, 3. Revelation 17, 3 said, He carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Revelation 21, 10 says, He carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, New Jerusalem. He doesn't go to a wilderness at this time to see a harlot. He goes to a great high mountain to see a holy city, Jerusalem. So in this vision report, as in the third one, one of the seven judgment angels come and carries him away. One of those angels carried him to the wilderness to see the judgment of the harlot. Now this angel carries him to a high mountain, and there he's going to see the judicial vindication of the saints of God who are under oppression, yet they will be vindicated by God's grace. He's going to see their reward. And their reward, as we will find out as we move through this message this morning, afternoon, their reward is a new Jerusalem 
the new covenant church gloriously established on the earth for all times. This is the goal of Revelation. God's heavenly Jerusalem will come down. Christians of the first century, despite your suffering, despite your giving your lives, the fact is you are involved in the coming of the kingdom of Jesus Christ in the first century that will come down and dominate world history eventually. And now it's already started the process, but eventually we believe that it will dominate the world scheme. And this new bride is going to replace the old harlot. The one woman is taken out of the way and another is put in her place. And so these four forensic movements in the book of Revelation are designed to teach the first century recipients, the original audience, that John suffers with them. He's on the Isle of Patmos. Just as they're suffering, he's suffering. But that God is in control. Though he's on the Isle of Patmos, he knows God is in control and that they will win. And this is a message they need to understand. Our apostle is on our side. He's suffering with us, but he says we're going to win because God is on the throne. But now let's consider, secondly, Revelation's narrative progress. And let's notice first in this regard a statement of Revelation's progress. The dominant scholarly consensus regarding Revelation is that it moves in terms of a recapitulation. It reviews and rehearses. Recapitulation. It moves in terms of a spiral is what's going to be happening. The, the events will spiral, spiral around and around. And John will offer to us a vision of these things, look at from different angles as the events go round and round in the spiral structure of the book. Revelation does not give us a straightforward, plotting, chronological progress so that we can think, well, if we read something early and we read something later in the book, that the thing we read later actually occurs later. It may not be the case at all. John is giving us a cyclical view of the events of the book of Revelation, but they're not purely cyclical. They don't just go in a relentless circle and never come out of that. They are cyclical and spherical. They are going around, but they're moving forward as they go around so that it's making progress and getting somewhere, and therefore it's a spiral progress. Now, even the premillennialist of the uh, 19th century, Henry Alford, agreed with this. Now, generally, premillennialists like to have the straightforward progress in chron chronological development. But Alford says, quote, All this forms strong ground for inference that the three series of visions, the seals, the trumpets, and the vials, are not continuous but resumptive. But though these visions move in a cyclical fashion, they are moving forward. Always keep that in mind as we have this recapitulation, this resumptive uh, method of John's. Now notice also, evidence for Revelation's progress. It's one thing to say, I believe it moves in cycles, but it's another thing to show why I believe it moves in cycles. This must be the case. It must be moving in a recapitulatory fashion for at least two reasons. There are many more, but two are all we have time for. Number one, the end comes several times in the book of Revelation. We're reading the judgment, and it looks like the end is here. Listen to Revelation 6, verses 12 through 14. When he broke the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. This is the first judgment cycle, and yet it reads like the, an end judgment cycle. When everything is shaken, all the islands are moved, and the stars are falling from the sky, it sounds like the conclusion, like the end has come. But we must recognize that that is not the case at all. Because 16 chapters follow this. After Revelation 6, there are 16 more chapters. And then consider Revelation 14, verses 14 and 15. Behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, 
crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe. That sounds like a concluding work. It sounds like an end time event. Yet, we find that Revelation continues for eight more chapters after chapter 14. And then there's another end sounding episode in chapter 16, verses 17, 18, and 20. The seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake, and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. But then Revelation continues seven more chapters. Each of these provide us with strong evidence of the recapitulation going on in the book of Revelation. Strong evidence of its cyclical nature. But there's another line of evidence as well. And we can see the cyclical nature of Revelation by noting Babylon falls several times. Revelation 14.8 Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. But four chapters later, we read chapter 16.19 The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. But then two chapters later, she falls again. Revelation 18, 2. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons. Babylon keeps falling. And these are not different events. That's a different view of the events. It's repeating it. For this reason, John is employing this cyclical nature of judgment for purposes of enhancing its rhetorical effect. One commentator, B.K. Blunt, says, quote, like any good rhetorician, John hammers home his single message by rearticulating it in a variety of ways. He is emphasizing the fact Babylon will get her just dues. And he does it by recapitulation. Well, let's now consider my third major point, Revelation story development. Now, I want to sketch in broad uh, strokes Revelation's dramatic movement. I want to look at its plot line just in broad strokes to see where it's going because I want us to highlight how John unfolds the dramatic movement and the Jewish judgment in AD 70. I didn't have a lot of time to fill out the AD 70 concept, but the fact is I believe the book of Revelation is looking to AD 70 and the destruction of the temple and God's judgment of the Jews for crucifying the Messiah. But now let's look at how John unfolds this theme of Jewish judgment. Now be aware, when you go into the book of Revelation, you have to understand not only to help you, but also to properly understand the book of Revelation. You must understand that Revelation is the most Old Testament flavored book in the New Testament. Its grammar is fundamentally different from all the rest of the grammar of the Koine Greek of the New Testament. It is a Hebrew impacted grammatical uh, form that we find in the book of Revelation. Some of the major commentaries that are of uh, academic worth have whole sections that deal with the grammar and the lexicography of the book of Revelation because it is so different from many of the other books. It has been impacted by Hebrew grammatical thought forms. Furthermore, we find in the book of Revelation many Jewish images, many Jew uh, themes from the Old Testament. There are many allusions to verses of the Old Testament and there are names and places that we find only in the Old Testament reappearing once again in the book of Revelation. That's because John is writing about, the, about God's judgment on the Jews and so he's approaching this matter as if he were an Old Testament prophet coming to the Old Covenant people of God and so he puts on the cloak of a prophet and goes after Israel in using this method. Now, I believe that Revelation is an Old Testament-oriented judicial drama regarding the destruction of the temple in the year 70 and the conclusion of the Old Covenant order. Let's notice in this regard the judicial relationship in Revelation. Remembering that we have to have an understanding of the Old Testament to unlock the book of Revelation, we have to realize that in the Old Testament, Israel was the wife of God. She was his wife by covenant. In the Old Testament, 
God has said to graciously marry Israel and take her as his wife. Isaiah 54, 5. Your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Jeremiah 31, verse 32. My covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Many other references make these allusions to Israel's relationship to God as a covenant wife to her husband. Therefore, when Israel is unfaithful, when Israel falls into idol worship, then she's committing what the Old Testament prophets call spiritual adultery or harlotry. Jeremiah 3, 9. Because of the lightness of her harlotry, she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees, that is, with wooden idols and uh, stone idols and things of that sort. The fact is, since she's married to God, when she goes chasing off after other gods, she's committing harlotry, adultery against her true husband. Ezekiel 23, 37 says, Israel has committed adultery with her idols. Now this covenant imagery is going to be very helpful for us to understand the legal implications, the judicial actions in the book of Revelation, to understand it is being presented to us as a forensic drama. So this, this will click here in just a moment. So let's look now at the judicial movement in Revelation. Revelation is heavily influenced by judicial images. The word throne occurs in the New Testament 62 times. 47 of those times are in the book of Revelation. That is, 75% of the appearance of the word throne in the New Testament occurs in the book of Revelation. And this is a strong judicial image. Revelation has abundant judicial language. We have the word judgment, the word uh, wrath, witness, and there's so many other judicial terms in the book of Revelation that are showing us that John is casting this as a forensic drama. The actual drama opens in Revelation 4 with a judicial image, God on his throne. Revelation 4, 2 says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. But what is being judged? We must now consider my third point, under this major point, the judicial decree in Revelation. In Revelation 5, we have a seven-sealed scroll held out in the hand of God from his throne. This is a judicial scroll. But what does it represent? I want you to consider this. Recognize that the focus of the book of Revelation is particularly on two prominent women not counting the lamb, who's the main dominant character, of course. But the two main characters besides the lamb are these women, a harlot and a bride. They are opposites. The harlot's judgment is emphasized in many chapters, particularly Revelation 18 and 19. And I'll later show you that I believe the harlot is John's image for first century Jerusalem who has crucified the Messiah, saying, we have no king but Caesar, crucify him, crucify him. Then the bride appears from heaven as a goal of revelation, the conclusion to the revelation drama. And so we have the harlot's judgment being emphasized through these latter chapters, and then finally after her judgment, we have the coming of this bride known as the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, in the uh, last two chapters of the, of the book. And I believe that she is New Covenant Christianity. And I'll come back to that in a moment and give you my thinking on why she is New Covenant Christianity. Therefore, I understand the seven seal scroll being extended by the hand of God from his throne in heaven above. I believe that that seven seal scroll is God's divorce decree against Israel, his old covenant wife. Now, John mimics the Old Testament prophets. He uses antiquated grammar. If you read, if you're New Greek and you read the Gospel of John or the Epistles of John, you'll see good Greek grammar. But when you read the book of Revelation by the same author, you'll find a very antiquated King James-like grammar, almost as it were. The idea being that he's using an antiquated grammatical form to get to these old covenant people and to present them as the enemy of God's true people. He alludes to many Old Testament verses. He even picks up Old Testament imagery regarding Israel as a harlot 
and brings that into the book of Revelation, suggesting to us that this seven seal scroll is a divorce decree. For instance, Jeremiah 3.8. For all the adulteries of faithless, faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorcement. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she went and was a harlot also. So here there's talk of a divorce decree in the Old Testament against Jerusalem or against Israel and Judah because she acted like a harlot. That's precisely what's going on in the New Testament, excuse me, in the book of Revelation. John writes, well, before I read that, let me read this. Jeremiah 3.3 adds, You had the harlot's forehead. You refused to be ashamed. Now, whatever that means, the fact is he's focusing on Israel as a harlot, and something about her forehead demonstrates that she's a harlot. John does the same thing. In Revelation 17, 5 of the Babylonian harlot, we read, Upon her forehead was a name written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. The scroll reflects Ezekiel's judicial imagery against Israel in the Old Testament. Remember, John is mimicking the Old Testament prophets, and particularly Ezekiel. Oh, that's next General Assembly sermon of how Ezekiel impacts the, the book of Revelation and John. It's, it's the dominant influence on John. Well, what we need to understand is that is, uh, Ezekiel's experience of the Old Testament Babylonian destruction of the first temple is being picked up by John to talk about the destruction of the second temple, and he's now casting Jerusalem as if she were Babylon because she's the one that causes her temple to be destroyed. In Revelation 5, 8, we read this. I'm going to read Revelation 5, then go back to Ezekiel, and you're going to see how there, John is obviously reflecting upon Ezekiel 2, uh, 9 through 3, 1. Revelation 5, 1. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. So you have on the right hand, in the right hand of God, from the throne, a scroll written on the inside and outside. Then, in Revelation 10, verses 9 and 10, he eats the scroll. It's sweet in his, in his mouth, but it becomes bitter in his stomach. You probably remember that, Revelation 10, 9 and 10. But when we compare this to Ezekiel 2, verses 9 through 3, 1, what does Ezekiel see? What is it that John is seeing on that throne in Revelation that is reflecting upon the Old Testament background, the background from Ezekiel 2? Ezekiel 2 says, Then I looked, and a hand was extended to me, and a scroll was in it. And when he spread it out before me, it was written on the front and back. And written on it were lamentations, mourning, and woe. Then he said, Son of man, eat what you find, eat the scroll, and go and speak to the house of Israel. Which is precisely what John is doing in the book of Revelation. And so the, the scroll written on the inside and out, that's in the hand, on the throne, that's to be eaten. It's, it's the same thing that John experiences in Revelation. And so in Ezekiel 2 and following... Ezekiel is seeing the devastation of Jerusalem, and in Revelation 6 through 19, John is, I believe, experiencing the destruction of Jerusalem in the New Testament era. Ezekiel 16 is God's covenant wife declared to be a harlot, just like in Revelation 17 and following, she's declared to be a harlot. Therefore, I believe that Revelation uh, Seven Seal Scroll is God's divorce decree against his old covenant wife for rejecting my son. Surely she will uh, obey my son. Remember the parable of Christ where he killed all the prophets. Last of all, I will send my son. Surely they will hear him. But no, they said, here's the heir. Let's take him and kill him. Matthew 21. Okay, let's consider now the judicial judgment in Revelation. After Revelation 4 and 5, Revelation 4 has God on the throne. Revelation 5 has this seven-sealed divorce decree coming from the throne. After Revelation 4 and 5, then you have chapters 6 through 19, which deal primarily with judgments on Israel. Now recall in the Old Testament how a harlot or a, an adulterous wife is dealt with. In Leviticus 20, verse 10, it's by stoning. Well, lo and behold, in the book of Revelation, we find the, the city Babylon, which is a, an image effectively of Jerusalem, we find in Revelation 
uh, 16, 19, and 21, we read these words. Uh, Revelation 16, 19 speaks of the great city, the harlot. And then verse 21 says, Great hell from heaven fell upon men. Every hailstone was the weight of a talent. We see this great Babylon being stoned to death with talent weight stones. And interestingly, Josephus, who was a first century priest and writer, who was a witness to the destruction of the temple in AD 70, who fought on both sides of the battle. battle. He was a, a general in the Jewish army at first, but then he defected and went to Vespasian and turned himself over to him and tried to get Israel and Jerusalem to uh, surrender so that they would not be destroyed. He saw the battle from both sides, and notice what he says. Josephus, in his Wars of the Jews, 5, 6, 3. The stones that were cast, he's talking about these catapults, casting stones over into Jerusalem. The stones that were cast were the weight of a talent and were carried two furlongs and further. As for the Jews, they at first watched the coming of the stone, for it was a white color. Now somebody here had hell down in their Texas town. They were telling me about while, uh, during this general assembly. Hell is white. Well, what we have here is Josephus giving a historical insight into the destruction of Jerusalem, and the, the catapults are throwing these white, one-talent hailstones, effectively, into uh, the city of Jerusalem. And so the match between Revelation uh, 1621 and Josephus is very interesting and fits perfectly with what, we, what I believe the book of Revelation is talking about. Well, what does Revelation's judgment imagery represent? God's divorce of Israel and then her stoning for adultery. Let's move on to the judicial result in Revelation. Having legally disposed of a harlot, his unfaithful Old Testament wife, what do we see? After God disposes of this harlot, which I've argued is his old covenant wife, then the next thing that happens in the book of Revelation is a new bride coming down out of heaven. Notice the flow. Revelation 4 presents us with God's judicial throne. Revelation 5 presents us the uh, divorce decree. Revelation 6 and following, the judgments for spiritual uh, harlotry and adultery. And then Revelation 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And Revelation 21-2, then I, John, saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride for her husband. The bride is the New Jerusalem. Why? Because she's replacing the old Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is replacing the original old Jerusalem. And in a few moments, I'm going to demonstrate this carefully, that this new bride is the church of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God. But we'll have to hold on off for just a few moments here. John's heavenly Jerusalem is an image of Christianity. He is showing that Christianity is replacing Judaism as God's ways among men redemptively. This is the grand finale and the conclusion to the book of Revelation. God is not left without a people when he destroys, destroys Jerusalem and sets aside geopolitical Israel in the first century. Then he takes his new covenant bride, the church of Jesus Christ. And so Revelation's flow shows the divorce of Israel, her capital punishment, and God taking a new bride, uh, the church of Jesus Christ. Well, let's consider now Revelation's ultimate goal. Revelation 21, verses 1 and 2 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. New creation imagery is used here, and the new creation imagery used here is important to grasp. Although I truly believe that at the end of history, we will witness a consummate physical new creation where we will be physically resurrected and will enter into the final sphere of things, I don't believe that's what John is talking about here in Revelation. What he's referring to is the spiritual new creation that begins in the first century and eventually unfolds until the, the consummate new creation comes at the end of history. Now let's notice uh, some of the evidence in this regard. What I'm saying here is this bride, this holy city, is a picture of the new creation salvation that we have in Christ. Let's notice the new creation declared. 
And first, notice the time frame. The description of the new creation runs from Revelation 21, verse 1, all the way through chapter 22, verse 5. And then listen to the very next verse. After describing the new creation, New Jerusalem, the bride, Revelation 22, 6 immediately said, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things which must soon take place. He wrote this in the first century and declared that these things will soon take place. Then four verses later, in chapter 22, 10, Then he told me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. A delay of several thousand years does not seem likely in this context. God putting away his old covenant wife and then not taking a new covenant wife doesn't sound right. And then the fact that God, uh, that the revelation says clearly these things are soon to take place because the time is near. You expect it to come immediately or very shortly thereafter. And so I believe that when Jerusalem is destroyed in AD 70, God is taking his new covenant bride, the church, and she is forever uh, his wife. And then notice the dramatic flow. John presents the divorce of old, the old harlot Jerusalem coming about in AD 70 and the taking of a new bride. And the fact is that there is an immediate replacement of her. I kind of got ahead of myself there. But the fact is that this immediate uh, replacement of the old Jerusalem with the new Jerusalem is because God always has a people in the world. He has his kingdom in the world. Well, let's consider the new uh, creation language here. The new creation begins unfolding, begins flowing and impacting history before the consummation. True, there will be a consummate new creation at the end of history, but it is already beginning to flow now, just like we're resurrected now uh, in Jesus Christ. We're raised up and seated with Jesus Christ in heavenly places, but there is coming a future physical uh, resurrection. Well, the same is true of the cr new creation. Now remember, I've argued that John picks up on Old Testament imagery often, and he refers to Old Testament passages. Now what we're going to see is Revelation 21 picks up on Isaiah 65, and we're going to notice something very important that many people do not see. Listen carefully. I want us to notice that John is obviously picking up on the language of Isaiah. Revelation 21, verses 1 and 4. I'll read John first and then go back and read Isaiah. Revelation 21, verses 1 and 4. I saw a new heavens, a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. He shall wipe away every tear and there, from their eyes, and there shall no longer be any death. There shall, shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. That sounds like the consummate order when sin is finally and forever done away with. But hang on. Isaiah 65, 17 and 19 says, and notice the very strong similarity of language. Behold, I create a new heavens, a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing, and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. That is the identical language, the identical imagery that John employs in Revelation 21. And it seems, upon a surface reading, to be speaking of the ultimate, consummate new creation. But... Isaiah 60, 65, verses 17 and 19, is followed by verse 20. And notice what it says. No more shall an infant be there, uh, I'm sorry, no more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. Now, this is talking about a new heavens, a new earth, where there's birth, sin, Aging, death, and curse. That simply will not be in the consummate order, but that is now a part of the new creation order in the, uh, the spiritual new creation that we're experiencing now. Clearly, John is not talking about the final consummate state. He's talking about what's going on now. 
Now, does not Paul teach us that you are a new creation? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have gone, the new things have come, which is precisely what John is telling us here in Revelation 21. This new creation is spiritually here in our redemption. Galatians 6, 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. The new creation is a picture of Christianity, the church, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and it's here now. Well, let's consider some of the description of the bride that John brings forth. If the bride is the church, how are we to understand the bold, dramatic language that he uses to paint a picture of the church? He uses elevated, apocalyptic imagery to pro portray the glory of salvation. Consider just a few samples here. The absence of the sea in Revelation 21.1. Revelation 21.1, And I saw a new heavens and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. This is an image of harmony and peace, because in the Old Testament the sea often appeared as a symbol of discord and sin. For instance, Isaiah 57.20, The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. But Christianity is offering the opposite. It's offering peace with God and among men. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. So instead of the world being a, a sea casting up mire, in Christianity there is a peaceful situation that prevails between God and man. The absence of the temple in Revelation 21.22. I saw no temple in it for the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Old earthly tip, the old earthly typological temple was where the presence of God existed for Israel. And that was destroyed in A.D. 70. Now we are the temple. And there are many verses, and I know you know them well. Ephesians 2.19, 1 Corinthians 3.16, 2 Corinthians 6.16, 1 Peter 2.5 and 9. We are the temple of God. That's why they don't need a physical temple anymore in the new creation, the spiritual new creation, because we are that temple. What about the absence of grief and death? Revelation 21, 4. He shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall no longer be any death. There shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. New creation salvation removes grief and death. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. You don't need to sorrow as those who have no hope because you have hope in Christ. He has taken away your sorrow. John 6, 50. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. There is a very important spiritual sense in which you will never die because of what Christ has done for you. Your body physically will fall away and die, but you know full well that you will enter into the presence of God at death. And so that's what he's talking about in Revelation 21.4, where there will no longer be any uh, crying or pain or death. What about the constituting of new family? 21.7 says, He who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Well, the new creation involves the family of God. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. And that's what he's talking about there. He will be my son. We are the sons of God. What about the majesty of the bride? She shines brilliantly like light. Revelation 21, 11 says, Well, Matthew 5, 14 says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. John tells us, that she is precious to God as costly gold and jewels. 1 Peter 1.7 says, The genuineness of your faith is much more precious than gold that perishes. John tells us she has a sure foundation and impregnable walls. If, if we were to read all of Revelation 21, we'd see that. Matthew 16.18 says, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We are secure in Jesus Christ. The source of our nourishment. The new city of God in Revelation 22, 1 is nourished by a river of life. He showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, 
coming from the throne of God and the Lamb in the middle of its street. Well, what does Jesus tell us in John 4:14? 4, Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. These images that John uses flow out of the images re relative to completed salvation in Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, I believe Revelation explains, justifies, and warns about the destruction of Jerusalem and the demise of Israel in the redemptive historical plan of God. We must understand Revelation in terms of the history of redemption. A.D. 70 was a major turning point in redemptive history. And Christ spoken, spoke often of it. I want to just mention two references, but uh, I've got a whole section in one of my books that just goes through Matthew and shows one reference after another. Consider these two. Matthew 8, 11 and 12. Many shall come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. But the sons of the kingdom shall be cast out. That's the Jews being cast out for rejecting the Messiah. Matthew 21, verses 43 and 44. The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and be given to a nation producing the fruit of it. And you are that new nation of God in Jesus Christ. But in doing this, John does not move in straightforward chronological fashion, remember. John is building a drama. He's constantly holding the reader in suspense until the very end when he finally springs the conclusion on them. And his drama has a glorious conclusion. The new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, comes down into to history through the work of Jesus Christ in the first century. Christianity is the fulfillment of the hope of Scripture. Let's pray.